Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button below. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au. Welcome to this Australian Water School webinar brought to you by IceWarm. Thank you for joining us today to discuss water pollution from coal mines. It's going to be presented by Dr. Ian Wright from Western Sydney University. And my name is Trevor Pillar. I'm the National Partnerships Manager here at IceWarm and will chair today's webinar. And I am greatly looking forward to it. There you all are spread across the world. Thank you for joining us. It's terrific to have this wide group of participants today. And I know it's going to be a fantastic time. Upcoming training, you can see there free webinars and online courses every month. This is the um, program. It's quite big and we invite you to go to the website. You'll find all the details. It'd be fantastic. So right into it. Let's introduce Dr. Ian Wright. Ian's a lecturer in environmental science at Western Sydney University. He has a long-standing interest in the impact of urban development and coal mining on streams and rivers. Ian's also an enthusiastic participant in community engagement activities in water science management projects and is often called on to provide expert commentary in the media. It's a pleasure to welcome you, Ian. How are you today? Uh, very well, thanks, Trevor. Great thrill to be here. Fantastic. And uh, that last little line about the media, I believe you might have had some work in that area on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, we have indeed. There's, there's been some media reports about contamination in a couple of Sydney's water reservoirs. Always issues with water and coal mines. Keeps you on your toes, I imagine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I think we'll get straight into this, Ian. Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Trevor. Um, and thanks everyone for joining me um, and jo joining us on this. It's lovely to see the numbers and I'd love to see the map of the world. So I'm gonna talk about coal mining. I've got a big interest in coal mining that's been going for more than 20 years now. It's not the only thing I do. I'm a water scientist with a background in the water industry. I'm now an academic. I'm still a bit involved in the industry, but water and coal, people don't always think of it together, um, but there's a very, very close link. Um, here's a view of uh, long wall coal mining, which is completely revolutionizing uh, the, the, the way of underground coal mining, but it's water. Here is an outlet for one of the mines that I've studied. This is the Clarence coal mine, and it might be counterintuitive to people, but when you dig a big hole in the ground and mine coal, and they dig huge holes, there's huge voids, whether they're roadways or long walls, but infiltration from groundwater seeps in and it's a huge area that's mined underneath. And so you've got huge seepage. And this is a discharge point. That's actually the licensed discharge point from a coal mine. What's the impact? What are the issues associated with this? How is it monitored? What's the impact on the environment? How's it regulated? I'm gonna talk about all those aspects, cover it, not in a lot of detail, but here we go. So here for me is, this is why I do this work. This is the first mine that I became concerned with. It's the Canyon coal mine, and this is a drainage adit. I last visited this probably about six months ago. I've been visiting it for um, on and off in different ways for 20 years. That mine shut 22 years ago, April 1997, the Canyon coal mine shut, but water still roars out of it. There's two drainage adits. Look at those colours you see on the rocks. That's not natural. Why is the drainage still coming out? Because the coal mining has changed the layers of earth that's cracked and water in filters, but it's probably also cracked streams and swamps above it and now heaps of water continues to flow through. Where are we? Here is a map. We're in the Western Blue Mountains. So west of the Sydney CBD in Southeastern Australia. And this is the Blue Mountains National Park and the Wallamai Wilderness. It's also a declared wilderness area. It's a declared wild river. And it basically ticks every box in terms of environmental significance. But you'll see this little red box up here. That is the workings of the old Canyon coal mine up at the top of the Gross River. This was started 70, 80 years ago. If you wanted to cause an impact and put a coal mine, you'd put it there. National Park wasn't declared. This is what it looks like today. So that's contamination that comes down. It's about a kilometre downstream from the mine and then it hits the Gross River. This is one of the most valuable and significant rivers um, in a conservation estate in Australia. It can flow all its length from above a thousand metres all the way down <coughs> to the 
tidal area of the Hawkesbury Nepean. And look at those colours. I'll talk more about the metals that we see appearing in this stream. But we're in the middle of a high conservation value area, mining's left, but the impact remains. So it was called the Canyon Colliery, ran from the 1930s through to 1997. And here is a view in the upper Gross River looking just above. And where my icon is, there's actually a contamination comes from a stream and flows down into the Gross River here. But this is just one of the mines I've been studying over the last 15 years. I've colour coded them. This is the Sydney Basin. Sydney, Parramatta, Penrith, this is sort of the Sydney metropolitan area, 5 million people. Underlying this is the Sydney Basin. It's an incredibly valuable coal resource. Some of these coal reserves are very low ash, very low sulphur, so they're used for steel making. Others are thermal coal, and this extends right above this area. Now, I've colour coded this. Red is closed, yellow is mothballed or care and maintenance. Green is active, so it's actively mined. The Canyon Mine is closed. The Berrimah Mine at the bottom is mothballed. It's actually in the closure process. And Angus Place at the top is also mothballed. That's called care and maintenance. So it's ready to be opened. Well, what are the impacts? I'm first going to talk about water chemistry and some pretty straightforward stuff. Major cations, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium. Upstream of the mine to the left, you'll see it's mostly in this bar graph, sodium, a little bit of magnesium. This, this is the natural geochemistry of the streams in the Sydney Basin, that's very clean. But then downstream of the mine and further to the right, the mine drainage, you see we've changed that sodium and a little bit of magnesium. It's now magnesium, potassium, calcium. We've changed the ionic chemistry of the stream completely from the mine drainage. So that's the cations, the anions, in many ways for me, much more interesting. So it was chloride dominated upstream, downstream, sulfate. Sulfate to me in Sydney Basin is a real indicator. If you've got a sulfate dominated stream, there's a high likelihood that's associated with coal mining. So the sulfur mix with oxygen and water in the mine and that creates sulfuric acid give some indication of those underground geochemical processes. We've also got carbonate and bicarbonate. Uh, and what does that do? It drops the pH. And I'm looking at another mine. This is the Georges River, and the Westcliff Mine. It's actively mined upstream, a snapshot of the major metals. So we see three in particular, iron, aluminium, and manganese. That's the orange, the yellow, and the purple or the magenta color. That's Sydney sandstone. That gives the sandstone, the geology around here, uh, the typical ochre, ochre orange, orange and yellow colors. But when we look at the mine liquid waste, we've got a whole series of other things. Pretty much everything we look for in the periodic table turns up. We've got copper, arsenic, strontium, barium, zinc and nickel, as well as the iron, aluminium and manganese. For me, straight away, Strontium, barium, that stands out. That's often associated with coal mines and um, the residue from coal mines in the Sydney Basin. But as an aquatic ecologist, I'm looking at down the bottom, the blue and the green, zinc and nickel. They're the ones that can be highly toxic to the animals living in the stream. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So coal mining and the waste from coal mines, and these are treated wastes, totally changes the metals, the dissolved metals in the waterways. So here we are back in the National Park. And right on the edge of the National Park, we have the Clarence Colliery. I've circled that and I've pointed to the surface workings. So this mine is currently active. It's actually working under state forest, but it's so close to the boundary. And this in Australia is a very, very famous national park. It's also part of the Blue Mountains World Heritage Area. And it has one of the living fossils that was only discovered about 20 years ago called the Wallamai Pine, living at an undisclosed location somewhere in this national park. So what's this coal mine doing to it? Here's a view of a former student um, looking at the Wallandilly, uh, Wallangambi River, just downstream of the discharge point from the Clarence, Clarence coal mine. Already you can see the bottom of that stream. 
it's got a lot it's very very dark uh, the mine drainage makes up about 90 percent of the Wollongabi River which actually flows into National Park and the World Heritage Area uh, about sort of 10 minutes of flow it's about about a kilometer from the mine outlet so zinc is one of the things that concerns me and so look upstream W1 that is in the Wollongambi River that's the average zinc level above the mine and then W2 is below the mine discharge W3 is about the point that it goes from state forest to national park W4 is 20 kilometers downstream so we're deep in the wilderness area deep in a high conservation value area really the highest you can get it's world heritage look at the zinc level zinc and nickel are both pollutants here of concern the dotted line is the Australian guideline. Above that dotted line, it is stressful for an ecosystem. Look at that, 20 kilometers downstream, it's still way above. That's originated from the coal mine. So here's a picture of me. Hello everyone, that's me jumping in a river. I'm the youngest of five kids. I was frequently called to, as a kid, go jump in the river. Now I do it professionally. There I am, I'm using a hand net I've just put that down the bottom of the river. I've stirred up the sediment. That is the Wollongambi River. And I'm about to pass the contents over to my um, trusty assistant behind me, PhD student, Nakia Belma. G'day, Nakia. So I've got the contents of my net. The question I'm asking here is, what impact is that coal mine discharge having to the ecosystem health of the river? I get my net contents and I look for animals like this. If anyone's familiar with the Brady Bunch, I call this my Brady Bunch photo. This just gives you some idea of the kaleidoscope of animal life in the bottom of rivers in the Sydney Basin. Up the top right, we've got a giant larvae of a dragonfly. Bottom left, that's a different species of dragonfly. It's covered in uh, silt and hairs, and that's a stealth predator. We've got beetles, stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, kaleidoscope of life. What impact is that discharge of the Canyon coal mine having? Looking at the family richness, so that's the number of different invertebrate families. W1, we had an average of 11 and a half families downstream. That dropped down to about three. 20 kilometres downstream is just above four. So that's just looking at the diversity, the number of different families, the abundance of animals. It dropped from a, a mean of just below 100 animals in my net downstream. It's about 90% less, W4, 20 kilometres. In conclusion, we're affecting the diversity of aquatic animals. We're affecting the abundance. Now, remember, these invertebrate animals, these are the food source for lizards, for birds. We've got platypus living in these waterways, um, unique to the Australian biodiversity. This coal mine is having an adverse, major adverse effect on the biodiversity of the river. How do we regulate this? It helps if you've got a law degree. Um, as a scientist, I've had to get my science in and understand how the legislation works. In New South Wales, the legislation is called the Protection of the Environment Operations Act. Here's a license for that mine, the Clarence Coal Mine. It's about 25 pages and it's full of conditions. This is called an Environment Protection License, has a unique number, license number 726. And that is how this is regulated. As a scientist, we have to get safe levels in here to literally achieve this, protect the environment. I'm gonna display that now, demonstrate it through another coal mine. So when now down on the Cumberland Plain, closer to Sydney, this is a map view of Appen. And so green is upstream of a mine discharge. And this is actually the Georges River. It's one of the big rivers that flows into the Sydney CBD in a place called Botany Bay. That's upstream. This is taken on the same day, and that's downstream. You can just see that turbidity. There's also more flow. From the Westcliff mine, that's the waste discharge. And here I'm looking at the nickel. I collected this data in 2012. I actually collected this for a court case. The mine at the time was owned by BHP and the local National Parks Association and the MacArthur Bushwalkers took BHP to court. They're a big miner. The mine's now owned by South 32, which is Spa. Let's look at the nickel here. Here's upstream, almost undetectable. Brennan's Creek is the tributary containing the coal mine waste. There's the dotted line, the safe level. Look at that level. 
Again, 18 kilometers downstream, way above the guideline. We've got a reference creek downstream. Huge nickel levels. Unacceptable. There was also an environmental ecological impact similar to uh, the canyon mine. So the conditions for discharge contained in that license, the EPL, Environment Protection Licence, that was number 2504, prior to April 2013, there were three, three, oil and grease, suspended sediment, pH, that was all. Yet look what was coming out, look at that turbidity. We didn't have conditions for any metals, yet they were coming out. After April 2013, these are the new conditions. We've actually got discharge limits for aluminium, arsenic, copper, nickel, lead, and a whole series of others. How did that happen? We did the science. We were in a court case. This is what happened. Now, you can't read this, so I'm just highlighting a couple of bits. But it's actually a picture of me. My sister said that she looked at the Sydney Morning Herald one morning and there was a picture of her brother. Um, she said, that wasn't a nice way for me to have breakfast, Dan. Um, but here's a highlight. The Environment Minister, Robin Parker, gave the Environment Protection Authority a stinging rebuke when she heard about the pollution yesterday. Front page of one of Australia's top papers. Basically, this got action. This was the Environment Minister of New South Wales. They encouraged the EPA and BHP to talk, now South 32, and they improved their licence. So you need science, you need policy and law, but media helps and politicians. But what happens after a coal mine shuts? Here's another one. This is looking at the Berrima coal mine down the inclined railway down to the mine shaft. There's the uh, there's conveyor belt leading up. Here is a view. This was Australia's longest running coal mine from the 1870s, shut in 2013. It's in the closure process. And I'm going to show you some photos of what part of this looked like after the coal mine shut. Here we have the drainage at it, which was sealed, but only partially sealed, basically so people couldn't get in there. The drainage still came out. And look on the right. Look at that ochre ferric um, discharge. Metals oxidised, they then fell to the bottom of the stream. And there was some machinery that was dispersed. Uh, this was owned by Boral, who have been good partners and have shared information with me through the closure process. We've got some data here. On the left, the pH of the mine, while it was operating, 28 to 2013, it was, it was mildly alkaline. They flooded about 15% of the mine after the flooding the pH dropped. So basically this, this, this mobilised sulphur, it went acidic and then that started to leach metals. Not huge um, negative pH, but it was mildly acidic. It is enough to make something like the nickel. Look at the nickel level. It was 150 micrograms. As it flooded, it diluted. Then it shot up after the flooding because the pH had dropped and we had mild acid drainage and then very high level of nickel downstream of the mine. So that's what can happen after a coal mine shuts. Again, getting back to long wall mining. Long wall mining, they take out the coal seam, then we get fracturing of the land above and the strata above, see all those big cracks. What can that do to a waterway? Let's have a look. Here is a study I did in the southwestern area of Sydney, in the Cumberland area. This is Red Bank Creek. I've studied this creek for years. And these are long wall passes. So the long wall is actually operating about four to 500 metres under the surface. What happens? What does it do to a creek? All kinds of stuff goes on. Check this out. Look at that creek. This creek has not been bombed. That is what they call upsidence. So as they took that layer of coal out, the whole landscape dropped by about a metre but some areas didn't drop as much because there wasn't as much pressure above it. And that's often in a V-shaped valley, the creek itself lifts up in relative to the land around it. It's called upsidence. Look at the cracking, the fracturing, the lifting, the warping, the twisting. Number one, that doesn't hold water well now, but you can see a bit of this ochre-like contamination. And one of my last slides, this shows water coming out. It's actually cracked an aquifer for a while, and there I have a student um, gathering data. There was actually no oxygen in this water and it was oxidizing on the surface and that was then uh, stripping out the oxygen, oxidizing metals, which then dropped to the bottom. 
um, all kinds of impacts, um, high metals, low oxygen, high salt. It's complex. It has ecological impacts. Um, and that's coal mining in the Sydney Basin. I've got lots of publications. I've given um, some here. But um, um, I'm happy to have questions. Trevor, how was that? It was great. It was good. I, I found it to be uh, something you could you could follow well and um, very clear. I, I said earlier in the chat line, brilliant, uh, clear um, presentation. And uh, I can see the questions are starting to come through. Um, Fantastic. You've done a lot of work on all this and uh, had a lot of people involved. And uh, I love your quote, go jump in the lake or go jump in the river, which is exactly what you're doing for a job. It's great. I get paid for it now. <laughs> it's great. For, for doing it's what my you revenge. Got, got hit, hit by the, the, the last of five kids. I, I know that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> um, why don't we get started with these questions? And everyone, uh, thank you. You've started uh, putting in uh, questions and discussion. That's really great. Keep them coming. Uh, that'll be fantastic. But uh, Pat Ridley has asked, um, how are the, maybe, uh, would be good, Ian, if you hit your Q and A icon, so you can just see a uh, read along that with me. Um, oh yes, see it there. Yes, so I the do. Top top one there is now being upvoted, and there's a few more questions coming in. So let's uh, keep the qu answers reasonably brief. But uh, fantastic. Let's just, here we go. How are legacy issues managed after mine closure? Uh, many mines expose acid sulphate soils. Uh, mining companies leave after mine closure and leave contaminated mine voids. Uh, how is this? Uh, how is this managed? Oh, that's a great, thank you, thank you, Pat. That's a great, that's a great question. Probably how long is a bit of string? <laughs> Ab absolutely, and we really have the full extreme of the, the, of the, of the two ends. The Canyon coal mine, um, that miner has walked away. Industry regard that as a disaster, both the regulators, um, consultants, and the miner. Um, and that impact is left for, in, for future generations. When I'm teaching students, I say, you're gonna have to deal with that, we're not. But then look at the Berrimer mine, um, bore or own it, they haven't walked away. They've worked with me, with the regulators, um, and they are actually sealing that. They've installed a treatment system. They've now sealed up the mine. And I think Boro are establishing a new benchmark. Um, so I'm hoping that's in encouraging the rest of industry not to leave a legacy issue. Uh, thanks, that, that's really good. The questions are now coming thick and fast. So we'll keep them moving. Uh, one here quite um, um, pertinent from David Harris, and quite important. Uh, what are the key methods to remediate legacy contamination issues? And thanks, David, for your question. Uh, uh, great to hear from you and your uh, high experience, long experience here in the area of water. Um, what are the key methods to remediate legacy contamination issues and effects to surface water quality? Can soft engineering approaches be adopted to improve post-closure water quality on receiving waterways? This is a pretty key question. This uh, takes time in, but this yeah. pretty deep, deep question. Uh, thanks, David. Look, that's a that that that's a beauty. Um, look, I've got to say, we've I've seen more answers to this really in the literature, and I've seen a lot come, particularly from the US. Um, but the greatest literature I have seen is actually from the United Kingdom, and because they lost so much of their they of their coal mining industry and coal mines shut down in the 60s, 70s. 80s and 90s. I think there might only be a couple of mines uh, around. Um, honestly, many mines are not remediated at all. Um, it's actually rare to have uh, a, a full remediation. Look, for underground coal mines, it's a bit different when you've got long wall mining and you've got major disturbance, um, subsidence and fracturing. This is an area that's not well dealt with. And I think a lot of the mines that are affecting um, waterways with fracturing um, aren't holding water well. The, the mining industry and consultants are trying to um, glue them up, cement them up, grout them up, um, but a lot of the creeks still lose water. We've very dry continent. We've got a drought in Australia at the moment, and that's a huge problem. Um, soft engineering, um, yes. And I'm thinking particularly now about open cut coal mines um, and reworking the disturbed areas. Um, you know, working with topsoil fertilization and revegetating, holding, um, you know, preventing spoil heaps from being eroded, um, and also controlling drainage um, and controlling the, um, the mobilization of sulfur and acid mine drainage. Um, and yes, soft engineering has a big uh, role to play there. 
um, I hope no. that covers, it's a complex area. I hope that covers that. No, it's fantastic. And any follow up to that, David, uh, by all means. The other thing is, uh, can we can we put on the chat line here? Maybe uh, my colleague Joel could uh, put it up if you can recommend um, a, um, a a website or a document that that uh, listeners attendees should go to. Is there anything okay. in particular you could you could think of off the top of your head right now? Um, uh, Joel would certainly be able to put it up. Nothing from the, you mentioned the UK. Yes, yes. Um, uh, they've got some incredible, incredible literature. And they've also got a whole litany of um, problems and also successes. Um, so uh, I've, I've really been quite impressed by the literature coming out. We can do it on the fly. Is there some, something we can look up right now and put it up for people to look at? Um, a website? Not, nothing I can think of at the top, off top, top, top of my head, I'm sorry. That's all right. We'll send it out when we send out the email to all the uh, registrants attendees after. Okay. So stand by, everybody. That, that, they're good, good references to have. Uh, all right, let's go to the next one. Uh, Car thanks, David, again. Uh, Carolyn Champion, amazing presentation. Question is, uh, question is, uh, is there a way to re-stratify a mine after closing to improve stability and prevent water release containing contaminants? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Great, great, great question. Now, I'm not sure if the term stratify. Trevor, could, perhaps you could help me. What, what does that mean? No, stratify. No, I couldn't. I couldn't. Um, um, but the, the main thing she's after is to improve the stability and prevent water release containing contaminants. Yes. No, I get, I, 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 I get that. Um, I, I didn't go into a lot of detail with the Berrimer mine. Berrimer mine's a great example. Ah, here we go. Layers. Carol, La Carol's talking about. Is a way Layers. To, 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 yeah, thank you, Carol. Yep. Um, so, so, the, so the Berrimer mine was the first example I know of in Australia. I'm happy to give Bora a rap for this. Um, the mine had shut. They were in the process of sealing everything up uh, and they were starting to flood the mine, 15%. They went back in, they opened it up. So they had to keep it ventilated, you know, keep air going um, and they had to dewater it. So, you know, you can't go underground if it's underwater. Um, and they, for, <coughs> for, for a while, they actually installed a limestone trench to lift pH and it also allowed you know, sedimentation, but a lot of the metals um, went out of solution, so sedimented and accumulated. Then they installed bulkheads and they're attempting to seal the mine and basically seal all that contamination in. Now we're all holding our breath a bit to see what happens, but at mm -hmm. the moment, the, the mine drainage discharge um, is trickling. It's not roaring out. It was mm -hmm. roaring out at 2.6 megalitres, Olympic yeah. swimming pool a day. Um, the level of pollutants have stopped and we're holding our breath that it holds. Now, the United Kingdom literature has shown that sometimes they call this rebounding. That is the mine floods the workings and that pressure, that hydraulic pressure can actually cause physical damage and it's actually blown holes out. Um, and the mine drainage has come out explosively. It's caused damage to civil engineering, um, you know, bridges, roads, buildings, etc., and also the pollution that comes with it. So I'm hoping this holds the Barry McColl mine. It was a pick and shovel mine um, at one point, but uh, it was mechanised in the 1930s. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to report back on that. So patchy, patchy so far. We, we have, we're, it's not absolutely clear about that, the... Um, that, that's a fair comment. Patchy, but bouquet, bouquets to the company giving it a go. Absolutely. Sure thing, yeah. Thanks, Carol. Uh, there's a lot more questions coming, so we might have to do these faster answers, but okay. let's go. Uh, yep, thank you. That's great, Carol. Uh, Mark Betting, Betting is saying, I was surprised to see that selenium and nitrate are not key contaminants of concern for these sites, particularly compared to metallurgical coal sites in North America. Are these deposits oh. simply low in selenium and nitrogen parameters? I love that question. Um, I'm learning from my audience now, Trevor. I love these questions. Good, good um, thing. <laughs> so two we, way we do thing. Test we do test for selenium um, and every single mine we go to, so we've been studying seven, everyone has diff a different kind of periodic table. A few common elements um, do, do really have really high levels. I've only recently started looking at nitrate. It is always high. Honestly, I had just been missing it. I'd also been seeing plant growth and algae in particular flourishing downstream. Um, so to be honest, um, I'm gonna add that in. We're adding that in now to our, to our studies. 
Um, so I think that's a, that's a, that's a great reminder. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Julie Martinson says, I think this is an important issue internationally and in Australia. Yeah, take that as a comment. Julie, thanks yeah, so thank much. You. Uh, Simon Travis has asked, are the analyte criteria only for coal mines or are they applicable across other commodities and industries? Uh, great question. Thank you, Simon. Um, you know, something funny we're seeing, we're actually seeing a lot of the coal products actually appearing in urban areas. And we think the link is um, one, one of the byproducts of coal mining and the power industry in Australia burns coal. Fly ash is often used in um, making concrete. It's a major component. And when, when the concrete leaches, which all concrete does, we start to see, you know, particularly barium and strontium uh, indicators for me. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's common across industry, but also in urban areas as well. And there might be a common link back to coal. Next one, Kirsten Braun uh, says, has there been in, uh, a change in downstream sampling sites at the active mine sites since the licence conditions were changed to include metals in 2013? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. That's a, that's a great question. Um, I've actually got a master's student studying the Georges River and looking at that mine. Um, and the answer is yes, it has improved. However, the EPA, the regulatory authority here, had given quite generous um, discharge limits, so they were quite high levels. In a way, you could say that they were, you know, legitimising um, the pollution. Um, but also, we're in a severe drought at the moment, and in fact, that river has stopped flowing from time to time. So dilution has dropped. Um, so we've seen some things improve, some things have got worse, but that's probably more due to um, climate. But yeah, great question. Thank you. Moe Tiong has asked, thank you, thank you for your passionate presentation, Ian. Is there a risk to Sydney's drinking water supplies? Um, thanks for the question. comment, Mo Moe, <laughs> many, many, very much. Um, and yes, there is. Um, one of, two, two of the mines in that, actually three of the mines in that actually go into water catchment. Um, Lake Baragarang, Warragamba Dam, our biggest um, water storage in Sydney. Um, and some of the media I've been involved in, in the last week, there is actually an accumulation of contaminated sediments from mining, probably long wall mining, um, in two of our oldest storages, Cataract and Cordo. So yes, it is accumulating in our water supply. It's not adversely affecting drinking water quality. Um, in many ways, people are tougher than aquatic life. <laughs> <laughs> well said, well said. Uh, Nicholas Cohn uh, has said, a lot of water quality assessment appears to relate to surface flow. Do we know what impacts on the subsurface water and is it this as critical? Might be able to take that in with the next one by Pankaj. Great talking. Yes. Have you found any impact on groundwater aqua in downstream and also impact on streams and wetlands near the mine? Uh, yeah, oh, spring, springs near the mine, he says. Fan, fantastic. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Nicholas and Pankak. Um, I, I don't tend, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not a, um, you know, a, a hydro geochemist. I don't go underground. I wait till things come to the surface. Um, without a doubt, there are, there are impacts on groundwater. Groundwater aquifers are really important in Australia. Most of our water is actually groundwater. There is definitely impacts down there. We see it when the water surfaces. So like the very last image I had, that was a cracked aquifer that was contaminated um, by the fracturing. Um, yes, absolutely, there are impacts um, in the groundwater. In terms of wetlands, um, I haven't studied many wetlands downstream but often wetlands above the mine have been cracked and then drained. Um, and then we've had, and some of these are very high conservation value wetlands in the Blue Mountains. Um, and we've often lost plants and fauna. Uh, great questions, thank you. We're getting some probing questions here. Oh, we are, they're, asked, they're, they're, it's good. Uh, mm, uh, I know EPA in New South Wales focuses on water quality. What do you think the Water Regulation Agency in New South Wales can do in the future to provide more support for water resource management? Um, I, I, I've worked really closely with the EPA and look, we probably weren't friends to begin with. I never got Christmas cards or anything, um, <laughs> but I, I've, got a, I've got an open dialogue now. I share with them the research. Um, they have changed. Um, I did feel for a while like a, like a, like a one person EPA with my students, um, but to be honest, we're changing the way they regulate in New South Wales. There was no doubt that industry, the coal mine industry had a lot of political support here and they've regarded any money spent on cleaning up the drainage as a waste of good profit. Um, so we're sort of attacking that culture um, by 
highlighting these problems and the EPA with the media, with the politicians, we're all learning together. Mm -hmm. No, there's a, there's a huge interest here today. That's for sure. And probably oh, a lot great. more in the recording as we, as we, uh, um, as we, after this, um, webinars over we'll put it up in the web and there'll be a lot more interest interest from there we'll track that as well uh julia imri imri has said have you found a significant increase in salt loads downstream from discharge points in your research oh we're getting great questions here uh trevor i really appreciate this thank you for that julie um yes 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 absolutely i didn't show you a lot of salt levels i often measure that as um electrical conductivity uh but yes all coal mine discharges here increase uh, dissolve anions and cations um, and sometimes we get an increase of up to 20 times in the salt um, and part of that is because some of the geology of Sydney used to be under the ocean so there's very very high salt levels down there but it's also when you break down and look at what's in that salt a lot of the pollutants are there and it's often a um, like a, a calcium bicarbonate um, salt that comes out so yeah, really good question, but yes, we do have um, mild, mild to um, moderate salinization associated with this. Another question here about groundwater, I'll take a lot of comes, uh, although it's number, yeah, it's down a bit, but it's all right. Brian Keogh has said, thanks Ian, with cracking in streams, disappearing the surface water, is there an increase in accessible groundwater? Oh, good question. Isn't it? Thanks, thanks. <laughs> Look, thanks Brian. Um, great question. Um, I'm not sure of the answer, but, um, this is already a point of contention. There are quite a few coal mines that um, look, we know we know that they're cracking aquifers and they're draining groundwater. Um, it, it's a bit, a bit hard to tell what's happening, but I'll tell you what, we, they're generating a massive volume of wastewater and that's possibly where the groundwater is going. And one of the biggest points of contention for a lot of people surrounding the coal mines is that they have dropped the level of groundwater um, and they can't, they either have to dig a, a deeper bore or they just lose access to, to, to groundwater. But yeah, great point, thank you. Um, David has asked, uh, do you think there's an opportunity for government agencies, academics and private companies to interact and share information to improve performance and breadth of environmental monitoring? Are there any forums or groups that can be set up to encourage a digital world platform for water quality? And that's getting, oh. to the, it's getting to the guts of the issue here. Yeah, look, thank you, David. That's 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 really really good at the moment i'd say it's rather disjoint in terms of the government agencies and it's probably you know for example the mining industry here, here is supported by um the you know for government it provides employment investment um royalties um and they'll do anything to encourage that but they need to balance that with the environmental impact so i'd say at the moment it's still a bit difficult for government and even i can actually see within government agencies there's a bit of a fight on their hands so uh, but probably leading that is community concern and it's probably community concern with the burning of coal and the impact on the atmosphere. In some ways, water gets forgotten. But look, I do see in all of my research, I actually link with local groups. I talk with stakeholders, um, plus I talk to the mining industry. And I think we all realise that we have to work together. We have to be open and honest about these issues. Um, I'm not anti coal mining, but if there's an issue, let's be open and honest about it and see steps taken to manage that. That's, a, that's, that's the moderate progressive view that we need to have, not just black and white. I mean, it'd be easy to do black and white. Anyway, Absolutely. let's go on. Camilla Scott, we've still got, still got 15 minutes to go here. Well, let's keep this going. Uh, Camilla Fantastic. Scott, how do you go about remediating the affected creeks with coal mine sludge? Um, how do I go remediating the affected creeks? Actually, actually I'm not sure about this one. Might need your help, Trevor. Using the coal mine sludge or the creeks that have been affected by the coal no, mine. No, the second. Yeah. Okay. Um, great example. Um, it's really difficult. Great question, Camilla. Um, when I was working on the Clarence coal mine, they actually lost their. Um, they they actually had a giant spill of their coal washings, and in fact, a whole lot of coal mine sludge entered the river. Um, short answer. Um, they were fined a couple of million dollars, but they spent a fortune. They sent poor people into that freezing cold um, mountain river and they used a sucking device to suck out as much of that contaminated sediment. The sediment contains so much more of the pollutants that tends to get mobilized and re, um, re, re, re literally diffused into the water quality. Um, 
it's difficult once it gets in there. And mm. sometimes it's just too late once it's in there. Yep. Great question. Thank you. Raphael has asked, how can we differentiate metal discharge contribution from the local geology uh, from those from activity of coal mining? Oh, good. Good question, Raphael. But that's why I always use upstream reference site. Um, and when I can, when it's available, I'll use more than one upstream. So I'd really learn what are the natural level of metals. So that graph I showed you um, with the metals upstream, we mm. always see iron, manganese and aluminium. They're key metallic elements of the Sydney geology. And once you know the background, and you really need, do need to know the background of, uh, level of metals, you can then see the signature of the mines. So it's, a, it's like a triangulation. You have the background, you're then looking at what's coming out of the mine, then you look at what's downstream. And it enables you to quantify how much of that metal is due to the mining. And so things like barium, strontium, lithium, titanium, zinc and nickel, and a whole lot of others, even uranium and arsenic stand out. Great question, thank you. Claudia has asked, have you done any measurements of metals accumulation in plants? Yes, thank you, Claudia, thank you. I've got an experiment running 20 metres from me. I've got a master's student. We are doing exactly that. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Claudia. Because um, one of the questions yep. is, we're just looking at invertebrates. Invertebrates can be quite tough, but what about plant life? That's the mm. basis of the food chain. And we are finding, yes, some of the metals are actually moving into plants um, and we're trying to work out where they're going and how, but the roots seem to filter out some of the metals, but we are seeing bioaccumulation in the plants. We've also done studies of my Brady Bunch photo of invertebrates, top left, predatory beetle. We've actually looked at contamination in, because it's a predator, it's a couple of steps up the food chain and we've seen bioaccumulation of metals in those beetles downstream of mines that don't, we can't even detect them in the water. And so that's biomagnification. Great question. Thank you. I love that slide of your Brody Bunch. It just shows you <laughs> the, the sheer, um, you know, breadth of animal life. Uh, and then the graphs showing how much they've been reduced by downstream. I mean, that, that has got to be saying something to us, uh, even though oh, we don't know the full, full effects, but we do know they've been produced. Hugely. Thanks, Trevor. Yeah, thank you San, very much. Sanjay says, other than the macroinvertebrate community index, do you recommend any other methods to measure the effects on aquatic life? Like, is there a point downstream where rivers actually recover? I'm, Trevor, I'm loving these questions. Um, they're fantastic. Thank you, Sanjay. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I do invertebrates because uh, it's cheap, easy. I've got the skills. I can train my students but there are so many other things I would look at. It really depends on what your river is. I would love, for example, to look at uh, platypus or if it was a major fishing river, absolutely I'd be looking at fish and looking at fish larvae. Depends, <coughs> you, pardon me, you've got to get approval to use different things, but algal diatoms are one of the best. We've been doing that. We haven't published much of that yet. Algal diatoms, single-celled algal cells, right at the base of the food chain, mega diverse, strongly affected. Um, you can even use riparian plants living in the bank or in the channel. Um, so yes, you can. Um, there's a lot of literature out there, but uh, yeah, I would like to have a go at the second part. Of yeah, that's the twist. The second part is the twist in the tail. It is. Is there a point downstream where mm. the recover? Again, thank you, Sanjay. Um, we picked... For two of those rivers, we picked 22 k's downstream and 18 k's downstream. We picked that, we thought, surely the effects will be over by here. A lot of the metals oxidise, fall into sediment and really leave the water column. How far? 22 and... 22 and 18. Hmm. Both of them were way beyond the guidelines at that level. And at 22, that was the Wollongambi, we still found the invertebrates were hammered. It was still having like a 60% degradation of the ecosystem, depending on what metrics we used. Um, and in both of those, it was just inaccessible and too difficult to access. Um, but yes, I'd like to find a point downstream where the rivers recover. Um, that's saying that, um, I would say for many mines, it's likely they recover in possibly even a shorter uh, distance. For some of them, we just did an upstream downstream comparison based on a limited 
um, you know, budget, availability of labour, and I've got to have cooperative students that can carry heavy packs in difficult locations. But great question. Fantastic discussion, everyone. I think we might make this the last one or two questions, though. Carolyn okay. Champion, in the UK, they taught in 2007 that succession plant planting can trap and hold tailings in place. In 2012, there was research in Canada showing that certain plants were able to bioremediate, bioaccumulate copper in order to remove it. Yeah, great. Look, great point. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at plants. We're, we're actually using willows <laughs> and we're studying willows um, there are pest species here, but they're also easy to grow, but we're doing it with a view to potentially using them for bioremediation or phytoremediation, if you like. So the idea of growing them and then perhaps ca catching that material and putting it probably in landfill. It's very, very hard once you put these contaminants out there, how you actually stop that effect further um, downstream. But yeah, that's, look, that's a really good point. And we are looking at that as a potential management technique to reduce the impact of, of contamination. Let's make this the last question from Julia then. Julia Emery, have you found an increase in algal blooms downstream from discharge points? And if so, what types? That's a really good question to finish on, Trevor. And a really good, really, really good question. In fact, we're working on that now. It's one of the reasons we've started looking at algal blooms. But I have, in the very low flow conditions we have in Australia at the moment, in the very low flow, I have seen filamentous algal blooms downstream and I've also seen algae in the water column so we are working on exactly that Julia I've seen it I haven't got it documented um, uh, but that's future research great point thank you just want to close uh, Ian before we close just say these two things thanks Ian very informative and a lot of information is highly transferable to other industries to write model conditions yeah that's 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 important Julia says, thanks, uh, Ian, great presentation. Also, Johannes De Beer, thank you for your comment. Great to meet you last week at the Groundwater Conference, Johannes. Uh, thank you, Ian, for a great presentation. Thank you. You know, you think you're more than a scientist. You're keen to see the benefits uh, that should come from science and that, that shines loud and clear. Well, I think we're just about there. I reckon we should close this down, maybe just have a look at this last page here, your feedback. We'll be really appreciating it. Uh, we'll send you a recording, a link to the recording of this, everyone. Fantastic. There's three webinars coming up there and they're, and they're filling up fast, I can tell you that. Online courses down there. Um, I won't say any more except to say we're so delighted that everyone's joined us and joined in the discussion. Uh, and thanks so much for your preparation and your time in all of this, Ian. It's been a great to work with you. Hope we can do it again. I, I, I would love to. And, and thanks to you, Trevor. I swarm and... Thanks for all the participants. They were really good questions too. And thanks for awesome. the encouragement. Absolutely wonderful. We'll do this again. Thanks everyone for joining like us that. today. We'll see you again and see you again in for sure. Thank you. Thanks Trevor. Yep. All the best. Bye for now. Bye. Subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscription button. For future webinars and online short courses, please visit our website at australianwaterschool.com.au.